Wendy Keats is the Executive Director of the Cooperative Enterprise Council of New Brunswick. We recently just finished a provincial election. All through that election was the narrative about New Brunswick's economy. And there are several people, like Herb Emery, UNB economist, and the Conservative platform, actually, who want to push natural resource development, manufacturing, and support of industry in order to improve our economy. Well, that sounds like an old story that we've heard since the mid-1980s. And how are we doing now? Nowhere could Wendy Keats get any traction in mainstream media or in the whole conversation about other ways of building New Brunswick's economy. Wonderful conversation. Lots of options. Great ways of building community. Here's Wendy Keats. Yeah, so are you in Dorchester now? I am, yeah. It's, uh, uh, back in 96, I was the first executive director of the Provincial Trails Council. Oh. And uh, I went down to Dorchester, I think it was the summer of 97. I met two lovely ladies. Um, uh, Sam was the town clerk. She kind of ran the yeah. town. Yeah. And um, I forget the name of the other lady, but they were on the board with the Trails Council. They gave me a great tour. Um, for most of the day. Some gentleman had written a book about the trails and the history down around there. Yeah. And typical with New Brunswick, we have a hard time telling people where the good stuff is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, signing. And so well, they took me right down by the, by the shoreline through some farmer's field. And yeah. we were by where the Acadians had hidden in, a, in an island off of there. And some of the original dock from the 1700s was still there, a couple of the wooden pylons. Yeah, I know exactly where you're talking about. And it's funny you should bring that up. That's part of the reason I'm down here. Um, there's an amazing community economic development co-op that was established here a few years ago when uh, the provincial government was threatening the closure of the school. And they rallied, they kept the school open, it just done amazing things. And one of the things is they revitalized the um, plans for the trails. So they're connecting, uh, currently, the Great Trail goes uh, in through Burroughs Creek and completely bypasses Dorchester and this whole area. So they're now connecting that trail all the way down to right where we are talking about and then up through uh, to Fort Folly where they have a medicine trail. And so we've been working on that for, I'd say, three years and um, just partnered with the Regional Service Commission and making it happen is going to start happening now so that's good. really exciting yeah good yeah. um we just gotten through a provincial election um can yeah. you offer what your take was on some of it what i'm interested in is the one of the narratives new brunswick has that it needs to shake in my view if i'm allowed to do that is this industrial development natural resource development model of what an economy is yeah. In seven years of doing the show, one of the first um, excellent speakers to this was Peter Linfield six years ago on the show about different economic models and different ways of building a province. And here you yeah. are doing it. So what did you think about the election and that old narrative coming up about, oh, we need to do natural resource development to build our economy? Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, COVID in particular has really... Um, it spurred the movement of people young and old towards a different kind of economy altogether. And, um, you know, we've realized our weaknesses, especially in things like uh, the food uh, supply chain and, you know, other supply chains and, you know, really the wisdom of, um, you know, directing our resources more locally, or at least uh, developing our resources more locally by communities in a more sustainable fashion. And uh, people are just really tired of the old way of doing things, that industrial, neoliberal economics approach. Um, they're just sick and tired of it. So, you know, our election, of course, was a bit unusual given all of the circumstances, um, but I certainly heard those voices loud and clear throughout the election from people saying, you know, we demand a different kind of economy where our small local businesses and communities, you know, have opportunities to, um, 
you know, to, to manufacture, to produce, to do all kinds of things that, you know, for the last number of years, we've been getting from foreign, you know, corporations and, and countries and, and people are just tired of it. They, they want a new way forward. And the interesting thing is that they're demanding a new way forward. It's no longer a request. So I hope, you know, our, um, our government listens and uh, because if they don't, I don't think that they'll end up staying in power very long. People are demanding a different way forward. Another interview from Days Gone By was with Carlos Gomez. Um, most of that was talking about building a drum and healing through the drum, um, indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. But the first 20 minutes were about how communities can self-govern in order to solve their own problems. Because he was part of a liberal government experiment back in the 70s, where up in northern New Brunswick, uh, Mark Lalonde, then finance minister, created two pilot projects. One was for the guaranteed annual income, and they ran that in Ontario somewhere. And Carlos was in charge of the project in northern New Brunswick for community self-determination on economic development. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was a huge success, and then it got shelved. <laughs> so yeah. this kind of conversation goes back a long way. Do you think we're at a spot where we can finally turn the beast over? And, you know, New Brunswick's so well suited for that model. Yeah. Is it time? Uh well, it, yeah, it's absolutely all the stars are aligning, I think. Um, you know, I, I recently wrote a blog called How to Build an Economy for the 99%. And, um, you know, really looked at what are the tried and proven models that have worked in building uh, an economy where people and planet are, you know, as important, if not more important um, than profit. And there's all kinds of models around the world that have been proven to work time and time again. You often think of the Mondragon cooperative model. I don't know if you're familiar with it in the Basque region, uh, you know, completely turned the economy around into, you know, self-governance, democratic business structures, sharing of profit, building of community wealth versus siphoning, you know, all of our profits off to somewhere else. And so there's all kinds of models and they were already growing. Like there was just a huge movement um, all across the world to move more towards, um, you know, these kinds of economic models before COVID hit. But since COVID hit, it's just been overwhelming. I mean, at the Cooperative Enterprise Council, we cannot keep up to the phone calls that we're getting from groups that, you know, have these innovative ideas um, that, you know, now they're seeing the opportunity, they're seeing the support, uh, you know, of consumers. Um, they're seeing, seeing this whole trend towards, you know, planet and, and inclusion and, um, you know, diversity in the workplace and um, all of those sorts of things that, you know, I've been in this field for 40 years. And this is truly the first time I, I've ever seen the uh, level of support. And I have to say, um, also in government, like I really have seen government shifting, um, you know, to listening a bit more to the people and responding more. I think that they too are realizing that this old model just is not, it's not sustainable. It's just simply not sustainable. It's like a pyramid scheme. And you know, we're, we've reached the peak. Um, you know, when you look at down in the US, there's, a, you know, three people, the three wealthiest people in the US own more than 160 million people combined. People are tired of that. Yep. You know, that's just, that's insanity. Just recently in Canada, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives released a report on the uh, economic measures through, in, through the first three months of the COVID-19 crisis. <clears throat> and that our Canadian top 1% um, had wealth growth that was way off the charts compared to most people barely able to scrape okay. by if it wasn't for the subsidy programs the federal government came up with. Yeah. Um, so, so it was begging the question about what is the good, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. So I wanna, here's a tougher kind of a question because we've lived with this in New Brunswick for quite a while. Um, 
there'll be a push against um, the way we develop our forests or the way we exploit our forests. Mm -hmm. And so the activists will come up with, we need to get rid of the softwood and pulp industry and we need to replace it with something that's value added and hardwood driven and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But whenever you ask activists, um, okay, there's 28,000 jobs roughly in that sector. So what's your conversion plan? Like, will it take 15 years, 20 years? Um, that always seems to be missing in the equation or it's what's used by the industrialist um, or that mindset. I'm thinking of Herb Emery up at UNB and the columns that he writes in Brunswick News all the time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but we don't have yet a clear path for the rollover on the job security issue. So jobs are always used as a threat or a weapon when there was any discussion about a change to another way of doing things. Yeah. Um, do you, given that you've been in at this for 40 years, you must see where the rollover is and how long it takes and what it looks like. Yeah, and I think it's a myth um, that, it, that the rollover takes a long period of time. Like the reality is when we look at figures, you know, when you're using value added forestry, it creates 2.5 times as many jobs as current practices and there's tons of examples and I think that's one of the you know the frustrating things is that a lot of these um, you know newer more innovative initiatives are being done often by community by small groups they don't have the resources to be able to get the message out there yep. so they can't combat those big industrial you know well resource communication strategies you know that sway public opinion yeah. um the reality is that there's tons of um very concrete scalable examples you know of how these sorts of things can be done in the forestry industry you may be familiar with um community forest international out of uh based out of sackville you know doing some fantastic work around um you know, carbon credits and so on that, you know, show how if you do sustainable forestry, you know, you can generate, I can't remember the figures, but something like, you know, $30 million a year in activity in, in New Brunswick, just in a really small scale, but easily scaled up. The solutions are there. Um, it's just that the voices of, of big corporations are much louder. And it's much harder to, you know, get the messages out and demonstrate. Um, but uh, especially, I think, during COVID, one of the things that really interested me was who really responded to the emergencies that were created during COVID. It was all these smaller community-based groups. They were the real heroes during this. They were the ones that were making sure people had food. You know, um, they were the ones on the front lines that responded like that. You know, they could pivot and they are collaborative and they work together. There's no competition. It's, you know, really about how do we how do we meet the needs of the community? And so we have a tremendous strength here in this province that is just ready to move at, at any time. Um, but yeah, there needs to be political will. Um, there needs to be more awareness of the solutions that do really work. And um, yeah, and there needs to be some investment. You know, when we look at for the fossil fuel uh, industry, for example, the investment that goes into, you know, research and development and so on is just, you know, it's in the trillions of dollars. If we shifted just a small percentage of that investment into these, you know, initiatives that are proving to um, be very successful, um, then we would have a very different, you know, kind of economy. But, you know, big corporations have got a loud voice. Again, a past interview, Amanda Wildeman and Ted Wiggins, then of the National Farmers Union in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. Amanda had this great tagline with, uh, or a great soundbite on, uh, if people spent just $13 a week on buying local produce, not $13 more, but shifting it to $13 a week local. Um, it had an impact cumulatively of $100 million for all the local farmers in the province. Yep. And I thought that should be a headline. You know, people should get that. That's how small the shift can be, but the scale can be that big. And the whole issue of food security um, finally made its way somewhere point number four or five on the different platforms for the different parties, except for the conservatives. I couldn't find it uh, in their top 10 kind of. But 
to bring up again that, that New Brunswick is built on forestry, fishing, and farming, and we spend a lot of time on the first two, and we don't talk about that third one much, but COVID seems to have taught us we better do something for our food. That, how much does that cross your path? Um, a lot, actually, and we are uh, very actively engaged right now with the Center for Local Prosperity on looking at the um, leakage out of Atlantic Canada. So um, New Brunswick actually is the highest in Atlantic Canada in terms of how much it leaks out of the economy. So about uh, 45 cents on every dollar goes outside of our economy. Um, but if you look at a 10% shift, and there's some really interesting work that's already been done on this by the Center for Local Prosperity, a 10% shift in that would create 43,000 jobs. And so one of the really big areas, there's some fascinating work that's happened, did originated out of the um, UK in a place called Preston, uh, that had basically lost all of its uh, manufacturing and construction jobs and convinced a few anchor institutions. So anchor institutions are um, hospitals and you know big institutions that are kind of anchored in a community to shift their procurement spending by just a small percentage and completely turned their economy around. That's been replicated in different places. And we're looking at replicating it here in Atlantic Canada. We've been having um, promising discussions with the New Brunswick government over the idea of shifting uh, some procurement spending. I'm very pleased to say. Um, we've been doing some research here with various anchor institutions and looking at you know, how many jobs could be created by simply doing small shifts um, you know, in how they use their tendering processes and so on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, this whole idea of being able to um, retain the money in, in our economy rather than, than shipping it away, it, it's, it's just, it's a no-brainer, right? Yep, and then you just have to get the shifts in human behavior, both uh, consumers and government pol policy. Yeah. Um, your yeah. comment reminds me of two past interviews, um, one with uh, um, Edouard Alain and Donna Terrio from CDC up at Ecole Saint Anne, and their social enterprise with uh, sourcing locally the food and then producing it there and, and rolling it all over so that it's uh, more of a circular economy as close as they could. Yeah. And they had a very clear window of uh, better food or vision of better food in the schools, bought locally and produced locally, um, compared to the frozen pizza or french fry or hamburger thing. Yeah. As well as uh, Levi Lawrence was on the show when he was running um, Real Food Connections, trying to be in that gap between the procurement policies at large institutions and sourcing it from farmers. And he was trying to connect those two things. And yeah. that was five, six years ago. He didn't have the breakthrough he needed on the yeah. procurement side so that he could go to the farmer and say, uh, I need, you know, five acres of carrots because exactly. these two nursing homes in this hospital are going to buy that from you. So it's, that's how close all those pieces are. Um, so is the tipping point uh, government policy or is it a consumer behavior that needs to catch on that um, where they spend their dollar is more powerful than their voting patterns, actually? Yeah, it's both. Um, certainly, you know, in the province of New Brunswick, we tender out a billion dollars a year on average. So you think of just, you know, what a small shift in that could mean hmm. um, in terms of our local economy. But consumer spending, and I mean, we are seeing this during COVID. Um, Amazon is growing every day, <laughs> you know because you know, they, they have the capacity to be able to, um, you know, to, to really respond and, and put a lot of money into things like this, whereas locally we don't. Um, so I think there's a real need for awareness and there's, there's not enough about that, you know, just you know, how, what an impact it makes uh, when you do just shift a small amount of your of your um, you know, the money that you're spending your budget to local. Like what a difference it actually makes. 
And I don't think we really have um, powerful enough information out there yet for people to be able to see it for the average person just to understand how it affects them mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, what a difference it makes in terms of the schools that we can have, the healthcare that we can have, you know, all of those things. It's hard to make the link between those two if you don't see concrete examples of it. Mm -hmm. So again, I go back to um, if we just had some resources to really uh, meaningfully get that message out so people can see that they, they would shift. But uh, it's certainly not going, unfortunately, in that direction right now because the big Amazons and so on have been able to, um, you know, just capture that market uh, by responding to, to needs and opportunities, which is what business does. So you can't fault them for that. Um, but, you know, also it's, it's not as easy to do for smaller groups. And so our government needs to get behind that. Um, but our consumers do as well. The uh, New Brunswick had a window for bringing in public auto insurance and all of the work had been done and the select committee had gotten unanimous for approval and then we had a provincial election and uh, the premier elect had promised during his campaign, Mr. Graham, that he would bring in public auto insurance and then of course it never happened. Um, when you look at Saskatchewan, Quebec, Manitoba, BC, and see what they do with that money and how they recycle it back into the province, that would be one of those great examples um, that you were citing. That this is how it doubles and triples and quadruples itself. Um, why New Brunswick never did that never surfaced other than, no, we're not doing that now that we're elected. There was never a, an explanation given for but they suddenly knew that all that work done previously and by all the other provinces somehow wasn't good enough anymore. Yeah. So that's a, I mentioned that because that's part of the obstacle. <laughs> How do we get over that hump that, oh no, that worked over there, but we're not gonna do it here. Yeah, and that's where the political, you know, the political influence and, you know, we have, I, I feel we have some fundamental flaws in our political system. You know, they're four year mandates um, you know, every time government changes, it takes them a year to figure out what their departments are going to be and just everything comes to a grinding halt. And, you know, I think one of the really interesting things, uh, Dennis, that has been evolving that really supports this, um, kind of shift is that in the past, anything that people wanted to do that was for the good of the community or the good of the environment or whatever, you know, they'd kind of set up these not-for-profit organizations and then they'd be after government for grants and, you know, it was never sustainable and, you know, volunteers, you know, working their little hearts rate out and with no resources. And, you know, that's how a lot of these social, environmental and cultural issues were addressed in the past. But community has started to see a very different way um, of doing that. And they're establishing social enterprises and cooperatives, you know, that are, that are businesses that then have more influence and more power and more resources and so on. And they're moving away from um, the idea of government grants and more on to self-reliance, which then also gives them the power to do things that they can't otherwise do. Even if it's advocacy work, you know, if you're a charity and you advocate too much, you know, against government policy, you know, we've seen the consequences of that. So there's always been sort of this, um, um, you know, I mean, hand on the top of the head pushing down saying you, you can only do so much. And that is actually starting to change. And uh, we're seeing the growth of these organizations and they're able to be more strategic in their planning and their education and their awareness and their advocacy and, and all of those sorts of things. So that's empowering um, the community. I find communities are becoming far more empowered now than they were before mm -hmm. and taking more and more leadership. And that's where it needs to come from. You know, it, it's the community groups and organizations and small businesses and so on that um, really need to, to, to understand that they do have the power, even as individual voters. Like, I don't think we realize how much power we actually have. And so more and more as people do become more aware of that, um, I think that that's, you know, collectively growing. 
and that that in the future, and especially with our millennials, you know, they're, they're not going to take the same things that we have kind of taken in the past. Yeah. And so they're demanding change and that's where it's going to be driven from. And that's, what's going to end up driving government policy and, you know, and who our governments are in the future. Do you think people understand what a cooperative is? No. <laughs> it's an obvious question. You know, we're bantering it back and forth. And yeah, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, yeah, like I get it, you know, but do other people understand member owner philosophy and its legitimacy and its power? No, it's one of the best kept secrets in the, in the country, I think, you know, and uh, there's a lot of people that do have mis, uh, a lot of misperceptions about what cooperatives are. Um, you know, but, uh, it, they have this fantastic, like there's been cooperatives around in Canada for 150 years. We actually have the oldest ongoing cooperative in the world situated in Sussex, New Brunswick. Um, it's the Sussex co-op. Yeah. I think we're at about 154 years now. Um, and, you know, cooperatives are twice as likely to succeed in both the short and the long term. There's all kinds of evidence. You know, they grew uh, after the 2008 uh, financial crises. They grew at twice the rate of the economy. They created three times as many jobs. Um, you know, they, they're very, very strong. Um, and they're strong because they're owned by the people that they serve. And they, they're democratic and people have a voice and they have a real sense of uh, commitment. Um, because they're an owner uh, in that. It's not just some company from a way that, um, you know, could, could give a darn. But I, I often hear, well, is Costco a cooperative? And I'm like, God, no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, they got membership. Yeah, but that's not what cooperatives are about. It's about members who actually, you know, have a vested interest and have some decision making, you know, ability <laughs> and ownership and so on. Yeah. So the model um, is not um, as well understood as we would like it. Um, but it is, again, it's growing all the time. We just got new legislation in New Brunswick. We actually have the most up to date co-op legislation in the country right now. Good. That allows for us all members. kinds. Of, oh, it really is all kinds of different sort of ways you can structure your co-ops to, um, you know, respond to whatever the local needs and opportunities are. Um, and we're always trying to get the message out there. And um, we're like the others, you know, we don't have all the resources to, yep. but at the same time, there's just, it, it, we just can't, again, can't keep up to the demand that we're getting for, um, you know, setting up new businesses under a cooperative ownership model. Buried in all of that um, and tying it to a bigger structural issue that New Brunswick has, which is municipal reform. Mm -hmm. So when I do little bits of homework here and there on municipal reform and in looking at the resistance to change that's inherent in New Brunswick when Sussex Corner votes against amalgamating with Sussex and Rosse and Chris Bamsis fights with St. John about working together, and you can go all around the province and find the same dynamic for 750,000 people that are all related by one degree, you know? Yeah. So that's, that is, I'm not poking fun at it, it just is, we do all those things. Yeah. So if municipalities need to find ways of generating new sources of revenue, is there a window there through a cooperative structure or are they still gonna be hamstrung until municipal reform finally goes through whatever version it takes? Yeah. We get on with, you know, tomorrow. No, you just set yourself up a couple of social enterprises using a cooperative model and you can start generating revenue, um, whether it's food production, um, energy production in your area, um, affordable housing in your area, those sorts of things. Yeah. Do they have enough autonomy yet just to get on with it? I can't see any reason why they couldn't because there is so much flexibility in how those things can be done. You know, you named a couple of really um, good examples. So, um, you know, uh, community owned uh, renewable energy, um, uh, community owned broadband. That's one of the really big ones that's coming up a lot. I mean, there, again, there's tons of examples of this all across Canada where these things have been done. And so it's not having to start from scratch. That's the other thing I love about the cooperative community because people share all their information. I often say to uh, groups, you know, if you're starting up a business, 
and you've got a competitor around, you can't write them and say, hey, would you mind sending me your business plan and your bylaws and so on? In the cooperative community, that's what we do all the time. You know, we're sharing information because we're, you know, vested in, in it being in the best interest of our community and not, you know, making big profits for faraway shareholders. So there's all these examples of community owned, you know, municipally owned, um, uh, different types of social enterprises and cooperatives that really can um, reduce costs. So, you know, generate additional revenues for municipalities, but also reduce costs for municipalities. So I think it has very much to do with the forward thinking of the council. Um, there may be some legislative barriers, but I don't think there's very many barriers you couldn't get around if you had the will. Interesting. Um, let's slide to broadband too and high speed internet for rural because New Brunswick has that other narrative that came up during the election about the rural and urban center um, myth or the gap between the two. Um, my interview with Mr. Vickers, he spoke quite well about bringing high speed internet um, to rural areas. So did Chris Austin and so did David Kuhn. Um, I'm not too as brought up to speed with a conservative approach to this, but it definitely would hit home for you that if this resource or this piece of infrastructure was in place, it would make a, even more demand on your, your team's time. <laughs> yeah. And that is, uh, you know, an issue that already, again, had been coming up and, and uh, not only just as an issue, but look at the opportunities, look at the innovation that's happening, you know, in other parts of the country. Um, but then when COVID hit, and especially around everybody having to work from home and, and, you know, schools trying to teach kids from home and realizing, you know, all of these issues around access uh, were huge. So again, now people are saying we, we need new solutions and we need solutions that are community owned that, you know, are going to address our small little corner of the economy because, you know, maybe out in uh, Johnson Mills uh, down past Dorchester Cape, they might never get Bell to come down there and, and put uh, high speed in. But there are opportunities for, you know, small, cooperatively owned, locally owned um, broadband that can be um, set up and, and is being done. And so people are getting more and more interested in it. One of the, um, I think one of the challenges that sometimes exists is um, getting, getting the right people around the table to lead forward on some of these initiatives. I often say that one of the most important things groups can do is build a strong foundation first for moving forward on some of these bigger ideas. And that requires some time and energy and coordination and you know things like that. People often like to jump right to the solution without building that foundation. Um, and, and that's really, really important. It's a lot of the work that we try to do at the co-op council is sometimes just slow people down a little bit and say, okay, let's really look at how do we make sure that we've got something that's gonna be sustainable in the long term. So when you're taking on big projects, you know, we see them in the renewable energy um, field as well. So taking on things like solar farms, community owned solar farms, uh, wind and so on. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to build that foundation first for the community ownership piece. Uh, but then once that's done, it, uh, it just takes off. So I think I'm seeing that right now, like some these small groups that have come together and they started to build that foundation. And now, especially around the broadband issue, it's like, okay, this, now we have to move forward. Now the opportunities exist. So, you know, how do we do it? And I know that there are, um, you know, some companies that are coming in now and offering to help communities to set up these sorts of things. And they are having discussions about it in diff different places in New Brunswick right now. So it'll be exciting to see what comes out of that over the next few years. What's your biggest challenge right now? Uh, well, <laughs> quite honestly, uh, keeping up to the demand is the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's so many people that want to move forward on these ideas and, you know, we don't have the resources. You know, we, we don't get any government funding to deliver co-op development services. 
Uh, we are a social enterprise ourselves, and so we generate all of our own revenues from the sale of, you know, our, our services, and then we redirect any of our profit back into helping, you know, with projects that there are no resources for, like helping these small groups in the beginning. They don't have money, usually, to pay for development services. And uh, so we have to be very creative around how we find ways to help them, but we're usually able to do it. But I have to tell you, it just taxes us right to the absolute limit. And um, I'm very lucky to have an amazing team of, of people that go way over and above um, because again, we just don't have any, we don't get any funding to do what to, to us is some of the most important economic development work that can be done in this province. In 2010, I had the opportunity to be part of a room of 220 some odd people as the business council in New Brunswick who pulled in all the top cats to the Bosager for two days on a brainstorming session on what can we do to improve New Brunswick's economy. Um, the underlying theme to it was how do we reduce the government debt? Um, a lot of the big wig business people were there, of course. It was a bit of a who's who. So it was interesting to be thrown in that mix because I was a bit of the more of where you're coming from. Um, <clears throat> of the 12 things that came out of that two-day conference, I don't think any of them have ever been implemented. And there was an irony to it all, too, because of the 12 things that came up, nine of them, I think, involved bigger government. Uh, when they were actually, their agenda when they started was to, how do we reduce government spending? The one that comes to mind right away was the 24-7 daycare like Quebec had. And uh, that way you get more people, mainly female, into the workforce. But one of the things that stuck out that the private sector could simply do for itself was more investment from the angel investors into projects in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So when talking to you and remembering that, I keep seeing this gap that where are they? Here's this huge opportunity to shift the model around and to do it a different way. And there's been hardly any movement at all from the angel investors into New Brunswick that I can find in doing research since 2010. It's like, okay, great idea. Let's go, you're all in the room. Like, let's go, let's get to it, gang. And, and nothing, it still is, we need to get 50 cents on the dollar from the government, or I'm not gonna do this unless I get government funding. And, I keep thinking, why do you keep borrowing from mom and dad when they're broke? Like, you've, you've, you've got the resources. Well, how, what is it that stops you from rolling it back into where you live? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, it, it's really interesting. Um, this is another best kept secret in New Brunswick. We have the most amazing community economic development investor tax credit program in the country. <laughs> Good. And, you know, uh, nobody knows about it. Um, it's so to start up, you know, one of these businesses we're talking about that impacts on community economic development in whatever sector we're talking about, uh, we're able to um, offer to investors 50% of their money back through this investor tax credit program that we have in New Brunswick. These programs are RRSP eligible, so you can redirect your existing RRSPs, you know, and get, keep your tax break from that, plus the 50%, to build pools of capital to invest in um, community in small businesses. And it is not used at all. And there's some really valid reasons for that. Uh, one is that it is a securities-based process, so you have to do prospectus, and you, have, you know, basically a prospectus, and it's very complicated, and, you know, the average group of community people could probably never get through the process. Um, but we're actually doing some pilots right now where we're hand-holding some of these community organizations through the process. You can raise $3 million a year per per uh, application. So, you know, in, in groups all across the province could be doing this. And the and this is not for, well, accredited investors can invest, but this is for the average New Brunswicker. So they can actually invest in their own communities and get 50% of their money back automatically um, and still own the share in their company. So it's like way, way better than angel investors, you know, ever could. Um, 
And yet I'm only aware of, we've had this legislation, and this is something the Co-op Council worked for eight years uh, to bring to three successive governments uh, before it finally got passed. And it's been in place going on four years, I would say now, and I am only aware of two that have got through the process, this fairly complicated process. So we've been saying to government for a long time, just put a little bit of money into building the capacity First of all, the awareness of, you know, um, of communities that this exists and then a little bit of money into building their capacity to get through this complicated securities uh, uh, process. And you'll have all New Brunswickers investing and keeping their money circulating locally and building all of these new businesses. Um, but we haven't had much success with that, but again, Community organizations always find a way to do something. So we were very fortunate to have just gotten some federal funding to actually move that forward um, and make people more aware of it and so on. Hmm. So, you know, oftentimes the opportunities are out there, but there needs to be support from the community level. So government puts the programs in place sometimes, but they're so hard to access that uh, you know, by the time that you've built the capacity, three or four or five years has passed and because you don't have the resources to do it. So there's a lot of money in New Brunswick. You know, like we're, there's a lot of people that have got a lot of money in uh, New Brunswick that are more than willing um, to invest in the community, but we have to create those opportunities and, um, you know, and support that and, and increase the awareness of those opportunities. And that's, that's, not, that's not an easy process when you don't have any resources to do it. <laughs> yep, it reminds me a touch when I read stories in the paper of a federal government offering infrastructure funding, and then you have to apply by a certain window of time and the municipalities might need 18 months and they're given six months. So, and yeah. then you get the follow-up story two years later that, well, $2 billion was promised by the federal government for infrastructure spending, but only $250 million actually got spent. Yeah. And like you just said, it's not that the money's not there, but there's something about the process that just jams people up. Oftentimes, it's connected to an election window, of course, which yeah. is to that other pattern of things. And Dennis, you know, there's something that you said earlier, too, that I would uh, just like to speak to around... Um, the reduction uh, in government spending, like how do we how do we reduce costs to taxpayers? Mm. So again, going back to some just really interesting models that have been rolling out across the country and around the world, and um, this idea of outcomes based uh, funding. So I'm just going to give you an example. There, uh, there's a a really dynamic uh, social entrepreneur by the name of Sean Loney, um, comes from the Winnipeg area, is known all across the country uh, for sort of the innovation around uh, social innovation, social enterprise. And so he talks about valuing uh, social outcomes and social costs. And so, you know, it costs, we, we, we've all heard the cost about how much it costs to keep somebody in prison or somebody in foster care or all those, those sorts of things. So, um, so what he's been demonstrating and he and, and another number of others have been demonstrating is that if you put, if you can contract something out, let's just, I'll use, for example, Build Manitoba is one example of this. So every year the city would put out, um, Winnipeg would put out contracts for, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, do the upkeep of their public housing. So, you know, painting and cleaning floors and, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and they would just go out to tender. So Build Manitoba suggested, all right, well, we'll tell you what, we'll do the contract for the same price, but we're going to track you know, how much money we save government because we're going to hire the unhirable. We're going to hire, you know, ex-offenders and drug addicts and, you know, homeless people and we're going to train them and, and we're going to track, you know, how much money we're saving government. And so it's been huge. I can't remember what the numbers are, but they've created some, you know, hundreds of jobs for people. They, you know, they've been able to show 
Uh, they do programs with them. So a lot of uh, these folks, kids are in foster care. They've been reunited with families and, you know, they've been kept out of jail. They've been kept off income assistance. And so they're tracking the actual savings. So there's a movement um, afoot for government to start uh, integrating those approaches into procurement and, and tenders. And uh, we're seeing a lot of things that are called community benefit agreements. And so uh, successful contractors have to be able to show how they're gonna benefit the community in which the infrastructure projects are being done, you know, by hiring from diverse populations, by, um, you know, creating things in the community, jobs and so on in the community. And so it's, it's unbelievable the dollar impact that it makes when you just shift a little bit, you know, and say, you know, these are outcomes that there's value and we can save money. So it's not just the cost to government, it's actually saving. And so everything that we do, you know, should look at how we can reduce the costs um, to government in particularly infrastructure projects and things that we have to do anyhow. Uh, so yeah, I highly, uh, Sean Loney wrote a book called uh, The Beautiful Bailout how community is going to solve government's costliest problems. I think that's the title of the book. But I think that's another approach that we have to look at. If we have money to spend, how can we spend it in ways that are giving us outcomes beyond just getting a room painted? <laughs> right? Outcome space. When, when, I mean, uh, I understand the intent and it was a good intent when we created the poverty reduction strategy some 10, 12 years ago now. Yeah. But the process um, for me is what stumbled the whole thing because it became an outcomes-based model rather than another way of, so we fell back into an old pattern even though we thought we were starting in a new direction. And now it's 10 or 12 years later and it's trying to justify itself based on outcomes and, and that was never gonna happen that way. It's closer to what Mr. Loney talks about which yeah. gets into F. F. Buckminster Fuller's quote about um, you can't change the current model by working within it. You need to build a new model to make the old model obsolete. And, and I know it's painful or it's challenging because we're in a window of time from 2010 to 2030 where a lot of the old models aren't going to carry us anymore. So if you can enjoy chaos a little bit and yeah. be willing to go play, um, all kinds of potential could surface that sets up the next 30, 40, 100 years. Yeah. Mr. Loney was brought to St. John, I believe it was last year. Yeah. And I, I happened to be in the room with a couple of other people. Some people dragged me, said, you gotta come listen to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> and Randy Hatfield and Human Development Council Bunch had brought him in. It was, uh, it was a really good full day. It was interesting to watch um, the 30 or so civil servants were there to listen to this new model. And you could see the frowns, um, but they were good frowns, like creative frowns. But yeah. how did you get there from there? Because in their world, it goes this way, not that way. Yeah. So that's one of those shifts. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so left. What's, what's really exciting for you right now? Like, what's, where's the juice other than you're overwhelmed with all, all the hardest work? But do you have a, a story or two about something that's really cool that no one knows about? Well, uh, we've been doing a really exciting uh, project called the Youth Partnership Initiative that um, was an interesting pivot uh, because of COVID. And a few, uh, some really exciting things are rolling out of that. And so I'm a firm believer that uh, the solutions to any of our problems are all in partnerships in all of us working together. So we had uh, funding for a youth engagement uh, project from the federal government that was uh, supposed to start in April. And it was about engaging young people in their communities in issues that they were passionate about. And uh, so we had, been, we had been doing the project for the year before that and it, it was wonderful and the government had actually given us an extension. Um, but then COVID hit, so it was supposed to start the 1st of April, engaging all these youth in the community. And uh, obviously we knew we weren't gonna be able to do that in the same way. So we pulled together a group of trusted advisors and partners and just said, okay, so you know, how do we respond? 
what has come out of that is this amazing uh, project where we have um, eight what we call nodes across New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, uh, where we have staff in each of those nodes and they're working with community partners um, to engage youth in all kinds of activities from local food to, um, you know, welcoming immigrants and newcomers to just engage. It's just a ton of things. As a matter of fact, one of our youth yesterday was profiled on CBC for having started this um, um, student senior matching program. So it just these all of these really cool projects are coming out of this initiative of engaging people with the community partners. Um, at the local levels, but the other thing that's happening is now all these partners are starting to come together and, cre and create all kinds of other new things that are that were unintended, you know, that we weren't really expecting to come out of it. But just by bringing people together and giving them a platform and some support and so on to have dialogues and talk about how they can uh, work together, uh, it's just been really exciting to see all of this stuff bubbling um, to the top and all these partnerships that are being created that are addressing um, the issues in the community, but that are also doing a fantastic job of engaging young people in figuring out what the solutions are moving forward. So that's been really exciting. And uh, one of the, um, again, spin-offs that came out of this was the whole um, issue of the way forward, and, and now so much of it is gonna be online. And really, how do you engage people and build relationships in the same way that you can, you know, when you meet people, it's terribly difficult. And everybody is struggling with the same thing now, and so, you know, we all identified that as we're talking to all of our partners, and we said, oh, well, let's all work together on this instead of everybody doing their own thing. So we have about 40 partners, community partners, that um, are working on developing best practices in an online engagement and all of these really creative ways of including experiential learning and outdoor education and, um, you know, techniques to as much as possible, you know, make people feel engaged in the in online because it's the way going forward. We know that, um, but we're such a civil society, you know, it's so important for us to feel those connections with each other. So it, that's been really exciting, actually, what we're hearing and having the opportunity to um, listen to what young people in particular are telling us about you know how they want to be engaged and so yeah that's another uh, another exciting partnership youth partnership initiative kind of project that's going on great um i want to give a bit of time for indigenous work mm -hmm. can you speak to that yeah absolutely so we one of our nodes is indigenous and you know we have great working relationships with um lots of our indigenous partners and and so we have jedi for example that you're part of the joint economic development initiative maui art who's doing this creation of an online gallery um, for aboriginal artists in atlantic canada and profiling their work and and uh, marketing it um beyond uh, so, and so we have a num we have indigenous um, coordinators and they're out working in our First Nations communities to um, support again use mostly youth in developing really creative ideas then we're hearing all kinds of things ecotourism and of course beautiful um, the arts and crafts that come out of our indigenous communities but there's also you know indigenous communities um, are naturally inclined towards cooperative and social enterprise. And so they've got some really cool things that are going on and we're really excited to be uh, working on them in, in various aspects. I, I won't, um, just for uh, confidentiality purposes, I won't mention what they are, but um, there is some really exciting stuff going on in our indigenous communities and they're real leaders, um, you know, in um, how to do things more sustainably, how to work together, and um, 
you know, how to really look at, um, I, I love Albert Marshall's approach to the two-eyed seeing. We've had Albert come on. I don't know if you know Albert, uh, you know, he's an elder uh, from Nova Scotia that lived through the residential schools and has come away with this approach called two-eyed seeing where he says, you know, Western civilization has a lot to offer. Indigenous people have a lot to offer. Just we need to, need to see from the two eyes. And so, you know, we're really seeing some wonderful um, initiatives coming out where uh, there's a cross cultural, intercultural learning. That's a big part, as a matter of fact, of our youth partnership initiative is to um, build relationships between cultures and, um, you know, new opportunities for moving forward um, from a different place than colonialism. Great. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, at least six to eight interviews now with different uh, Indigenous leaders and um, sharing their stories. And it's obvious that the mesh needs to occur now um, mm. to get us out of where we've come from to where we need to go. Um, so, and, and after we sign off, if you could stick around, I have a couple of, of other questions. Sure. Okay. I've done the formal interview part. But uh, how would you like to send us out? What, uh, you know, assuming three to 5,000 people watch this, what do you want them to know? I want them to know that there's a very exciting new way forward that's, that's coming. Um, as a matter of fact, it's not even coming, it's here. And um, that we really welcome, welcome them to get involved in some of the just absolutely amazing, innovative initiatives that are happening to support their communities at the local level. Mm -hmm.